Relapsing remitting MS is uh, the version of MS that we've had the most success at treating. We now have 15 approved medicines for relapsing disease. Um, and the, the most recently approved was ocrelizumab, which was approved uh, in the uh, early part of 2017. Um, we, we're moving towards looking at agents that have had comparator studies, so drugs that show that they're not just efficacious versus placebo, but efficacious versus an active comparator, which we haven't always had in our field. Um, and so this was an example of a successful active comparator set of studies for relapsing MS, preventing new lesions, new relapses, and, uh, and disability. They've started now to release the data um, from ocrelizumab from its extension study, uh, and that data this spring was even more impressive, perhaps. Uh, patients treated in the one-year extension with ocrelizumab uh, were shown to have basically zero enhancing lesions. And we've really never seen something like that in our field before, so it, it goes to show what can be accomplished over the longer term in treating relapsing MS with, with that agent. So with any uh, disease-modifying therapy, you have to take into account the safety profile and try and figure out how to take the data from the clinical trials and apply it into our actual practice with real patients who may have other comorbidities and more complex medical histories and situations to treat. I think with uh, the new medicine, ocrelizumab, we have to think about potential risks for infection, uh, the possibility that uh, our most feared opportunistic infection, PML, uh, can appear with this agent, which is something that we're going to have to contend with. And then we have to think about things like opportunistic cancers, malignancies. So there's a small signal for breast cancer seen in the clinical trials for ocrelizumab, and that's something that I think we need to think about in the background, talk to our patients about, make them aware uh, that it is a possible risk, and then see how that data looks over the coming years. Now, other medicines that we have also require screening for infections. So uh, at this point, I, I, I tell my trainees that we really have to think about a panel of infectious risks when we are looking at changing or starting an MS disease modifying therapy. So we, we look at the history of hepatitis exposure, which is important for uh, our, our B cell depleting medicines. We look for a history of tuberculosis exposure. I'm from New York, so I have to think about that. And anyone who's been on the subway in New York, we have to think about the possibility that they've been exposed to TB. So we think about TB exposure for several of our medicines. We think about uh, the immunity to chickenpox as being important. We don't want patients on certain medicines for relapsing MS that could suppress the immune system to be naive to chickenpox. We don't want them catching that for the first time. Uh, and then finally, the, the big one is to look for a history of JC virus exposure. And that's become a really crucial uh, test for us in trying to maximize the benefit-risk ratio of natalizumab and it may ultimately pertain to minimizing the risk of PML with other medicines. We first saw the data for ocrelizumab back in the fall of 2015, so I think there's been interest in this agent for relapsing disease and for progressive MS, for primary progressive MS, for quite a while now. Um, so patients will be asking about it, and I think it's important for all of us that treat MS to be familiar with the, the pros and cons of ocrelizumab. Um, its efficacy in relapsing MS was very substantial. Uh, the efficacy in primary progressive MS was modest, but it was statistically significant. Um, so I think in, in my relapsing patients, it's a somewhat different conversation about high efficacy and, and the risks that may be associated with that. And in primary progressive MS patients, it's a more tempered conversation um, to think about what they can expect from a medicine that may slow down the accrual of disability for them. Um, and then also with the safety issues that we have to think about there too. So the risk-benefit ratio is a little bit different for relapsing patients uh, considering ocrelizumab and progressive patients considering ocrelizumab. Um, but I think the whole field uh, feels that it is a step forward, especially to have options that are approved for primary progressive MS, which we haven't had until now. Yeah. 
Well, teclizumab is another monoclonal antibody that was approved this past year for relapsing MS. It was studied in a head-to-head -head trial also against uh, an injectable interferon. So we have data for superiority here for this agent over one of our long-standing injectable medicines. Um, teclizumab is given once a month by self-injection. So from a dose frequency perspective, that's favorable as well. Um, it does, however, have a set of possible side effects, uh, particularly relating to liver function which has to be checked monthly before each subsequent dose. So it's a yeah. commitment to both get the blood work done and, and do the injection, um, as well as the possibility for cutaneous or skin reactions, which at least from the clinical trial were occasionally severe. I haven't seen a, a broad enough uh, sense of what it's been like in clinical practice yet to really comment on it in, in standard practice, but those are the things from the, the trial data and from the way the approval was written with the monitoring that we need to do uh, that I think everybody does need to know about teclizumab. So one of the things I think which is interesting about how we're conceptualizing MS now is the concept that there's an overlap between the categories of MS, between relapsing MS and secondary progressive. Um, we've seen this even in the success of recent trials, so ocrelizumab being successful in relapsing disease and primary progressive MS. Uh, Saponamod was successful in secondary progressive MS and we'll see if it ends up approved for relapsing disease. So there's something to be said for an overlap, which is something that I've worked on with the topographical model of MS. Uh, the topographical model is intended to depict MS as more of a continuum rather than individual buckets of relapsing and primary progressive and secondary progressive disease. So it's a somewhat more inclusive way of looking at the disease as a whole. I think the topographical model may have usefulness in how we think about our treatment goals in MS, but also even how we explain the disease to our patients. What's above the threshold and what we see clinically, what's below the threshold, what we see on MRI. Um, so the topographical model is my way of trying to clarify that in a visual way and, and, and help to use it to teach patients about the disease. It's actually available now as an app uh, on the App Store for iPad. It's free, um, called MS Topography, and, and people are using it and, and talking about it as a way of conveying some of these nuances to their patients.